quick, before I start, I really want to thank Angular Beers and especially David for inviting us out to come and do a talk tonight. I mean, no, seriously, can, it, can we give David a round of applause, please? You know, Ionic's an open source project, right? And we have a very large developer community. The developer community is so important to us. And it's really organizers like David that make that possible. Uh, and groups like Angular Bears. So we're so grateful to be here today. So OK, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ionic 2. My name is Alex. I'm the dev advocate at Ionic. Uh, you can reach me anytime on Twitter, directly by email. I'm also on GitHub. I post samples and such on GitHub all the time. That's my little dog, Allie. She is exactly as angry at me as she looks in that photo. Uh, but my name is very long and very difficult to spell, so this is the easiest way to identify me online. Okay. Also, uh, as David mentioned, Ben is here. Ben Sperry, the co-founder of Ionic. Say hi to Ben. Sweet. So, uh, who's familiar with Ionic? Good number of people. Who has done production work with Ionic 1? Ionic 2? Ionic 2? You're my favorite people in the room tonight. <laughs> okay, so for anyone who's not familiar with Ionic already, Ionic is a hybrid mobile framework, right, for building hybrid mobile apps. And it's, built, uh, it's both built with and built on um, AngularJS. So Ionic 1 was built with Angular 1. Ionic 2 is built with Angular 2, right? Also, the whole framework is written in TypeScript. And as well, you can write your Ionic 2 apps in TypeScript, OK? Now, I'll mention that you do not have to write your Ionic apps in TypeScript, but definitely, same as with AngularJS or Angular 2, very much, uh, very, we very much uh, suggest that you do that. And I'll get into that a little bit about that later. Uh, also, Ionic, open source, under the MIT license. That means that the framework is now and always will be completely free to use, whether you're using it just for development, just to learn, or in production for your company, OK? So definitely, if you aren't familiar with Ionic yet, feel free to check it out. And the last thing that I always like to mention, and that's very important to us at Ionic, is that the framework is built 100% on web and browser standards. And we feel like that actually has a lot of implications uh, that, again, I'll kind of talk about as I, go through, as I go through this tonight. But first, very exciting. Ionic 2 is in release candidate, right? So uh, who are the Ionic 1 developers again? OK, cool. So we, uh, Ben, what was it, three weeks ago? A month, about a month ago, right? About a month ago. Uh, Ionic 2 came out of beta and had its first release candidate, RC0. We've since done another release candidate, so currently we're in RC1. And it's gotten really great, we've gotten really amazing feedback from, the, from our developer community and our users. Uh, also, RC2 coming very soon, and you will see some really fantastic, for anyone who's already been working with Ionic 2, you'll see some really fantastic improvements uh, there as well. So like I said, the developer community, very important to us. Develop, uh, you know, pretty much everything. The majority of what Ionic does as a company is the open source is the open source framework. So, developers, you know, have been very good to us. They love Ionic. We have over twenty five thousand stars on GitHub. Also, the number one TypeScript project on GitHub. Even more, even more stars than Visual Studio Code. So that's kind of that's kind of a big deal for us, right? Also. Various times, anywhere from a top, from a top, you know, 20 to a top 50 pro project on GitHub overall, and again, really important, hundreds of contributors to to the framework. So when you work with Ionic, you really are joining a part of a very large community of of developers, jo JavaScript developers, Angular developers, mobile developers as well, right? So if you fancy yourself part of the open source persuasion, then please do consider joining that community and contributing directly to the framework as well. And the last thing is over 200,000 NPM installs per month for the, for the Ionic CLI, which is the primary way to use the framework. This is really exciting for us uh, at Ionic because already, so we've been in release candidate for about a month. We were in beta for, I don't know, a number of months. But 
Attic 2 was announced less than a year ago, and already over a third of those installs account for, are accounted for by Ionic 2. So the adoption has been really fantastic. And again, very important to us because it gives us the feedback that we need to improve the framework for all of you to use, all right? Companies also have gotten really into using Ionic to build their hybrid apps. Uh, the only reason why I show this slide is to, is to just impress upon you that hybrid is not a toy anymore, right? There's been, there's been a long history in the world of hybrid app development, right, about whether or not it's ready, whether or not it can perform. And I think it's important to show this just so that you know that hybrid, hybrid app development is in production at major, at major companies, major traffic, right, major usage. So pretty big deal. All right, enough of that. On Ionic 2, it's awesome. It's really awesome. It's not like Tyrannosaurus flying a jet, awesome, quite, but pretty awesome. I love it. Um, quick rundown on some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, Ionic 2, again, built on Angular 2 and TypeScript. Theming, much easier, in, uh, much easier, much more powerful in Ionic 2. We have, much, we have faster load times, both for components and for the initial application load. A lot of that is thanks to, thanks to ahead of time compiling in Angular 2, which I'll get into later on. Performant animations. So Ionic has always been known for being quite performant, especially when it comes to its animations. Ionic 2 blows it out of the water, to be, to to be totally honest. And then on top of what we've introduced in the framework as well, WK Web, we have some really exciting news about WK WebView. We have Ionic Native, which, which improves the whole process of using Cordo Cordova plugins to access uh, native device APIs, right, in your, in your hybrid apps. As well, Ionic Cloud, and again, I'll get to that in a moment, and first class support for progressive web apps. Another kind of a big deal for us. So if you haven't used Ionic before and you want to try it out, again, distributed through, M through NPM, so NPM install dash G Ionic. And then the second command there, Ionic start from the CLI, will just scaffold a basic project for you. Right now, if you want to do an Ionic 2 app, you pass the V2 flag. But soon, when we come out, when we come out of release candidate and have final release, this will actually change, and you'll get version 2 by default. Right? OK, let's get into talking about what's actually available. So one of the first things that a lot of people think of or, uh, or a lot of developers come into contact with when they come into contact with Ionic is the UI components, right? Uh, a, very, a very common way to think about the Ionic framework is sort of as the missing SDK for the web, right? Whereas, for example, iOS has UI kit, right? When we, when we develop mobile apps on the web, we kind of are working from scratch. JavaScript doesn't really give us anything in the way of standard UI components out of the box to make our applications look and feel like real, uh, real, real uh, mobile, app, mobile apps, OK? So Ionic ships by default with a whole set of really fantastic UI components. Uh, if anybody has worked with Ionic before and they think that it's a very pretty framework with some very nice UI components. You can thank that man in the front row right there. He's, he is very largely responsible for it. Um, so all, kind of, all kinds of the standard components that you would normally get if you were, say, a native developer, right? So everything from side menus to pickers, action sheets, sliders, right? Car, things for layout like cards, like cards, grid, right? Uh, all of these things you get for, you get from uh, Ionic absolutely for free. And also, I would like to mention that, you know, Ionic 1, the components look fantastic. They look great even cross-platform. But in Ionic 2, all of the UI components also conform much more tightly to the, to the platform-specific style guides for, for each platform, okay? So when you use Ionic, on iOS, the components are going to look like iOS components. When you, when you use it on Android, they're going to look like Android components. They're going to look like material design components, right? And also, Windows Universal, uh, there, we have a theme for that as well. Any Windows developers in the audience? I didn't think so. OK, good. <laughs> so all right, so just on, on, that, on that topic, styling and theming, like I said, much, much improved 
in Ionic, in Ionic 2. I, again, Ionic 1 is, is great, but we've made a lot of improvements in Ionic 2. Still 100% CSS using the SAS preprocessor for all of the styling. This is fantastic because, again, if you're a web developer, right, or a web app developer that wants to get into mobile app development, you already have the skills to use Ionic, right? There's, not, there's, nothing, there's nothing fancy going on under the covers as far as being able to theme your app or to customize it to look the way that you want it to, all right? Just CSS. Uh, everything very easy to override, both at the global and the component level. This, uh, this is also really cool because, right, Angular 2, who's familiar with Angular 2? Awesome, a lot of people. Okay, so you know Angular 2, right, the component-based structure of, of Angular 2 apps, right, lends itself very, very well to, make, to being able to have a lot of granularity in customizing the look and feel of your Ionic apps as well. Uh, also, variable-based uh, sty styling and theming, so when we, 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 in Ionic 1, yes, we had a lot of SAS variables available in order to, in order to uh, declaratively tweak the look, the look of, your, of the base UI components, but in Ionic 2, we've added greatly expanded support for SAS variables, so almost every single, uh, almost every single part of, of the styling of every UI component in Ionic has a SAS variable available if you say don't want to have to, con to introspect uh, the, the CSS and do overrides that way, right? Uh, as well, over 80, 80 mix-ins to get you started with theming, so some really nice, some really nice baseline themes to, to get you going. And we've also added over 25 utility attributes. So, uh, you know, a lot more, lot more kind of attribute-based attribute declarative templating in Angular 2. So in Ionic 2, we have a whole set of really useful, of really useful utility attributes to handle common layout issues like text, text alignment, vertical alignment, these, sort, these sorts of things, all right? On the templating side of things, if, you, if you've used Ionic 1, it's gonna look pretty familiar to you. The major, the major difference in Ionic 2 is we've gone, we've gone to primarily from, from, in Ionic 1, right, we used a lot of class-based declarations for the UI components. In Ionic 2, we've gone much more to, uh, to uh, uh, tag-based and attribute-based declarative structure. This is good for a couple reasons. So the, the first is that you don't end up with these long class declarations in your templates, right? Makes the code much easier to read, more maintainable at the end of the day. But also, but also, the use of the declarative attributes, so for example, you see here there's like width 10 or offset 25, right? Makes it a lot easier to separate, to conceptually separate what the framework is providing versus what customizations you're bringing in to your application. Makes, makes the code a lot more maintainable, uh, we feel, and a lot easier, a lot easier to develop. As well, Cross-platform styling. So this is uh, a view of a single app from, I, from Ionic Labs. So if you use the Ionic CLI and you run Ionic serve dash dash lab, you get uh, this view where it shows how your application is going to look side by side across platforms. All of the styling differences that you see here are absolutely free. I did nothing to change the styling between these views. So everything from the default system font to very small, to very small differences like <clears throat> the height and positioning of list elements. Uh, you can see here the tab, the tab bars are a little different or are, uh, are positioned differently. And also things like the icons, right, being different. All of this Ionic handles for you cross-platform out of the box absolutely for free. You don't have to do anything to get, to get this really nice base styling of your application so that it looks like the platform that you, that you want it to run on. Now, you can totally, again, right, everything is fully customizable, very easy, very easy to do. If you want to have material design in your iOS app and make your iOS users kind of annoyed, you can do that. You can absolutely do that. Uh, that and it's really just a matter of passing in, uh, passing in a class to specify that, right? Super easy. Uh, so, 
One last thing with uh, respect to talking about how Ionic is built on web and browser standards is not just that it makes it fantastic for hybrid apps, it also makes it really fantastic for the mobile web as well. So who's heard of progressive web apps? Cool. So for anyone who's not familiar with progressive web apps, this is actually something that Google has been making a lot of noise about recently. A progressive web app is essentially a mobile web app, but that will act much act and perform much like a native app, including having offline functionality. So with a progressive web app, the user can choose to install to their home screen. It'll have an icon when it launches. It won't have it won't have the navigation bar, right? For all intents and purposes, it will look just like a normal, a normal native app, and it'll perform that way too. Because Ionic is built on web standards, the cool thing is your Ionic apps already are progressive web apps. It really is as easy as dropping in a manifest file, dropping in a service worker at, to, handle, to handle a lot of the offline capabilities. Little bit of making sure that you're not, that you're uh, having fallbacks for your Cordova plugins and you have the progressive web app already running. So with Ionic, right, you can run on mobile, you can run on the mobile web, and now progressive web apps are very, are very easy. Pretty exciting. So if you're interested, we actually have this site, pwa.ionic.io, where you can see some examples of progressive web apps, or you can come talk to me afterwards. I have a few on my phone. Uh, also, two members of the core framework team, uh, Adam, and Bra Adam and Brandy, they did a really good talk, just an intro to progressive web apps, at Angular Connect uh, a month ago, and this is a link to the YouTube video for that if you just kind of want, if you're not familiar and you want an introduction. So, pretty awesome. But none of this, like, really matters, right? Unless it performs. So from day one, the, big, the, the yardstick, right, the goal of Ionic has been that it needs to look and feel and perform like a, na like a native app, right? We needed to provide both developers and users the full, the full performance experience that, user, that both them and users would come to expect from a mobile app. So this is just a few points around performance in Ionic 2. Now have native scrolling. It's no longer JavaScript scrolling in, in Ionic. That's pretty awesome, so no, no scroll jank. 60, 60 frame per second page transitions and animations. For uh, anyone who's not aware, right, 60 frames per second is the threshold that the human eye can, can perceive jank. Everyone knows what jank is, I assume? Yeah? I know jank all too well. So, <laughs> so all, all, of the, all of the page transitions that you do in, in Ionic 2, as well as uh, almost all of the animations, run, run now at 60 frames per second. Thanks to, feature, de, thanks to features like uh, the Web Animations API as well as, well as uh, Hardware Accelerated CSS. And in the cases where you're not going to see 60 frame per second in performance, the difference is going to be in the single digits of milliseconds. So in almost all cases, right, you're going to get complete native-like performance in Ionic 2. Also, as before, all of the UI components are optimized for touch events right out of the box, so your users will get that full native experience out of all the UI components from, from Ionic if you use them. And we get some really nice performance gains uh, in terms of initial app loads, time to first paint, for example, and, and subsequent page loads as, you, as your users navigate from view to view. Angular 2 is obviously a big source of these performance gains. So who has worked on some production Angular 2 at this point? A few people? Cool. It's pretty awesome, right? It's way, it's way more approachable, way more approachable and easy to get up and running with than Angular 1, in my opinion. Anyways, um, there's no made-up words like transclusion. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I like that. Uh, so we've worked you know, very closely with the, the Angular team all throughout the development of Angular 2 to ensure that the Ionic framework and Ionic 2 are getting the most possible out of, out of the performance gains of Angular 2 as well. So and that's, on top, that's on top of you know, all the niceties 
of Angular 2, the simplified syntax, the, improve, the improved dependency ejection, uh, you know, TypeScript, the addition of TypeScript for all of our ES6 polyfills, as well as much better tooling. It's really great. But the biggest thing to talk about with respect to Angular 2 is ahead of time compiling. Anyone familiar with, it, with AOT? A few people? All right, awesome. So ahead of time compiling, in a nutshell, what it is is historically, right, when we built an Angular 1 application, we had to, we actually shipped the Angular compiler with our, with our application, right? And so all of our, all of our Angular code compiled down to, to ES5, essentially, uh, just in time, at runtime. There was a not insignificant performance, not, not just performance hit for this, but also bundle size hit for having, for having to do this. So what ahead of time compiling does is it takes the it takes the compilation process of Angular and moves it from runtime to build time. Okay, so consequence of this not only do, not only does all of your does all of your code ship pre-compiled, so it executes much 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 faster at runtime because the compilation process doesn't happen. Your bundles can also be very greatly reduced, not only because the Angular compiler no longer ships with your app, with your app code, but also because the use of, because TypeScript gives us some really nice advantage, the static typing in TypeScript, right, gives us some really nice advantages, like it allows us to perform tree shaking at build time. So tree shaking, right, just does a static analysis of the, of the code base and uh, essentially removes unused code from, from our applications uh, before, before they ever ship. This has can, ha can have very significant impacts on final, the, fi the size of the final bundle that you ship. We've actually been told by the Angular team that they've gotten their Hello World application down as low as 28K, with their goal being between 10 and 15. Just to put that in context, jQuery as a dependency, gzipped, is 28K. Right? So you're talking an entire application with all of its dependencies at that kind of size. Uh, also, again, because you don't, have, there's no just-in-time compiling in Ang it, when you use uh, AOT for an Angular 2 or an Ionic 2 app, greatly increased initial page loads, time to first paint. We've actually seen we've actually seen uh, some of our test apps load as much as like four to eight times faster. So very, very significant in that respect. And all, again, no just-in-time compiling, so uh, subsequent compo component loads when you, for example, when you, tra when you transition to new pages and, they, and they're injected into the DOM for the first time, much faster than before. For an added performance boost, we also have WK WebView. So for anyone who's not familiar with WK WebView, right? Uh, it's been, this is uh, the successor to UI WebView on iOS, and it's been available in, I, it's actually been available on iOS for, hy for hybrid apps to use since iOS 8, but the problem is it's been essentially useless due to some, due to uh, cores issues, cross-origin resource sharing issues when, when uh, Ionic apps or Angular apps were calling to the file system. So what we did at Ionic was we forked the Cordova plugin, and uh, and patch those and patch those issues, and we now feel that our fork of the WK plug of the WK WebView plugin is production ready. So this is awesome because it gives us uh, access. The primary the primary thing that it gives us in terms of per performance is access to the Nitro JavaScript engine. So this is right. This is the next generation of JavaScript core on iOS, and that is that actually outperforms uh, that actually outperforms the JavaScript render uh, compiler in Chromium. Also, I'd really like to point out that Nitro is the nice marketing name that Apple gave to gave to this particular engine. The WebKit name for it is Squirrelfish. It's got this awesome logo that Ben hates, and. <laughs> It gives us, in my opinion, the greatest icon in the history of software development. So, not too bad. On top of that, though, a lot of really nice things. What, what, squirrel, so, Squirrelfish, right, like, like Chromium, is, uh, is a just-in-time 
uh, compiler that actually compiles your JavaScript down to bytecode, to, ma to machine code, has huge performance impacts on the, on the execution time of your, of your JavaScript code in the browser. But not, on, not only because, right, bytecode is, is going to be able to execute a lot faster, the, the renderer or the compiler is able to uh, do a lot, a lot better analysis of how to optimize the execution of that code. So also native scrolling, right? That's something that we get out of WK WebView, as well as, of course, faster rendering, faster compute, and access to the latest device APIs. So the other thing, right, the other piece of hybrid app development is always going to be access to native device APIs. And if we're talking that, generally we're talking Cordova, right? With the, introduce, with the introduction of Ionic, of Ionic 2 and Angular 2, right, what we've done is we've started a new open source project called Ionic Native. And what Ionic Native is, is again, it's TypeScript wrappers around Cordova. Makes it very, very easy to create nice TypeScript wrappers for, Cordo for existing Cordova plugins uh, to, get, to give your apps your Ionic 2 apps access to na native device APIs, uh, written in TypeScript. Really cool feature of it also is it adds support for promises and observables. So anyone who's done a lot of work with Cordova knows that a lot of Cordova plugins were actually written, were actually created you know, quite, quite some time ago in some cases. And so many Cordova plugins are still using the old callback pattern. The old callback pattern. So we get, really nice, uh, we get really nice promise and observable support added to our Cordova plugins with Ionic Native. Also, 100% framework agnostic. It's called Ionic Native, but you do not have to use this with Ionic. You can use this with any TypeScript application, Angular 1 or Angular 2. Looks kind of like this in usage. So again, basic, basic TypeScript, right? We just, import, we just import the dependency from Ionic Native, in this case, geolocation. And then for anyone who's, where, I, anyone who's a web developer or a, or a hybrid app developer, I assume that you've used the geolocation feature before, either in the browser or on, or on the device. So this will look pretty familiar, geolocation.get current position, and you can see that the, that the callback in that case, right, because it's only going to return once, has been transformed into a promise. Similarly with watch position, which is going to return continually, we have observable support so that you can subscribe, right? So just a very basic uh, look at what that actually looks like in your code. This is, a, this is actually a relatively short list of the Ionic native plugins that currently exist. Uh, so everything, right, all the things that, that are generally important to a hybrid app, things like keyboard, camera, file system, SMS, uh, touch ID, app ratings, text-to-speech, all kinds of really good stuff. And the, again, this is not a complete list. And on top of this, right, there's nothing stopping you from using any other JavaScript, every, any other norm, normal Cordova dependency in your Ionic 2 apps. So on top of this, right, you still have full access to the entire JavaScript ecosystem, right? And if you do want to create your own, if you do want to create your own Ionic native wrappers for an existing plugin or for a plugin that you're working on, it, you can come and talk to me later. I'll show you, I'll show you what it looks like, but it's dead, dead easy. So the last thing is, you know, a big goal of, of Ionic has always been how do, we, how do we make it so that developers, especially hybrid app developers, right, don't have to reinvent existing features, right? Don't have to rewrite the same things over and over. And so with that in mind, we introduced Ionic Cloud. This very quietly came out of beta uh, very, very recently. And uh, what Ionic Cloud is, is it's just a server-side platform to provide a whole slew of, a whole slew of uh, common server-side features that mobile apps, needs, mobile apps need. So things like push notifications, right? Uh, you can do native builds. For, so, so we have a service very similar to PhoneGap Build because I'm sorry, Windows users, but you will never, ever, 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 ever be able to build an iOS app on your PC. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> so PhoneGap build and, uh, and uh, Ionic package, very good services for, hand for handling that for you. 
in, in the event that you don't want to get a Mac, yeah? Uh, as well, we have, we have a, a service for handling uh, hotfixes, live updates to your JavaScript code, a known but surprisingly little known feature of hybrid app development, right, is if nothing else, your JavaScript, JavaScript, right, can be loaded dynamically. That means that you can push hotfix, you can push hotfixes, new features, anything you want uh, to, your, to your hybrid app and bypass App Store review. And there's absolutely, there's absolutely no rules against that, right? So we have a service that, will, that makes it easy to do things like beta testing with that, A-B testing, uh, and also just makes it easy to, put, to generally push, fi push uh, code and to roll back too. I don't ever have to roll back, I don't, I don't ever, never have to roll back code, but maybe you do. So, <laughs> uh, that's a lie. But anyways, also user management, right? Uh, not, not just user management in terms of, thing, of things like you know, profiles and such, but also login, right? A lot, the OAuth dance handled for you. And we have a really nice free tier for Ionic Cloud. 10,000 push notifications per month. You can do 5,000 app updates, 100 native builds, and you can manage an unlimited number of users. And th these are monthly limits. So if you're interested, ionic.io slash cloud. Really great service, whether you're looking to just kind of get some features in there quickly for your prototyping phase, or also to, for production as well, all right? So again, you know, all, the, a big reason why I come up here and I talk about, about all this, all the new features of Ionic 2, is, just, is mostly because what I really want to impress upon you is that it's easier than ever to realize the original promise of hybrid, going all the way back to when Cordova first hit the scene, right? We can build performant, we can build performant web apps that look and feel like, like native, right? Using, using hybrid methodologies, using web standards, right? Running one co having one code base that runs everywhere that's maintainable by a single team, right? And that looks great across every platform. So that's, no one has to listen to the sound of my voice anymore. I hope that makes you feel good. <laughs> if you want more information though, we have awesome docs for, for Ionic 2. Uh, the Ionic blog, very developer focused. We have tutorials there. Uh, quite, quite often I write, I write things on the blog. The Twitter, uh, we have a Twitter account so you can keep up with us and who doesn't need even more Twitter in their lives? So we have another Twitter account, Ionatron. That's our friendly little build bot down there in the corner. But especially if you're, if you, if you're an Ionic developer, really good to follow Ionatron because you'll get a lot of the, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll get uh, a lot of the uh, release updates and such, right? A lot of the release notes uh, you'll be able to keep up on. And lastly, 100% open source framework. Everything, so the, the framework, Ionic Native, the Ionic CLI, these are all MIT licensed open source, open source projects. So if you do consider yourself an open, so an open source contributor, right, that's the kind of thing that you like to do, please do consider joining the hundreds of developers that, are, that have already contributed to the framework. All right, that's it for me. Thank you very much.